And it is known that uh, different people show different immune responses to the same immunological perturbations, such as pollen or <coughs> vaccines. For example, uh, only a fraction of people have aller is allergic to pollen, or some people respond well to vaccines, but others don't respond so well. So the question is, how different they are? How different are they? And why, why are they different? And the approach of uh, population immunology that measures a lot of people and their immune responses over the course of time can potentially answer this question. So, so I need a question because people say it's immune response allergies. They're instantaneous. But immune response takes about three weeks. Why is it immunological? This allergy is instantaneous and people have it first exposure. So mm -hmm. they don't even have time to develop any immune reaction. So why it's called immune? Uh, okay, so I agree that these two types of uh, responses are different, immunologically different, but they, uh, they share some characteristics because they are related to some genetic background related to... Um, genetic, yes, but why they're um, called uh, environmental. Well, not immunological, they're something else. Yeah. I, I don't know. Okay, so maybe, maybe I can answer the general questions later. <laughs> so. Okay. No, 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 it's still, I mean, just answer because well, it's confusing. Mm -hmm. It's not immunological. It is. 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 Immune system which always reacts to the anything, yeah? I mean, it's, it's not learned. It's ready to go or it has to be built and then goes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And so I'm interested in the approach of population immunology. And, and we are, t this time we examined the cohort of 300 volunteers who cooperated with us and, and received seasonal influenza vaccine in 2000, winter 2011. The cohort consisted of 100 males and 200 females, aged 32 to 66, so they are middle-aged people. And we used trivalent inactivated influenza vaccine containing hemagglutinin proteins of uh, these virus stocks. So they are the very, very usual ones. And we collected peripheral blood on four time occasions, namely uh, before vaccination. And one day after and one week after or three months after vaccinations. And we analyzed these blood samples. And individual blood samples were split into two tubes. Uh, one tube was used for measuring six B cell markers like this. And the other tube was used for measuring T cell markers like this. So as you see, they are general, very general markers classifying the basic subsets of B cells and T cells. And in flow cytometry, each of these markers uh, is measured for each single cell in the blood. So what we get is a point cloud of cells in a multi-dimensional space. So seven axes, seven dimensions for T cells and six dimensions in B cells. And it usually in immunology, immunology studies, we select only two axes and show a two-dimensional plots like this. But please note that this is only a fraction of a much bigger picture. So to analyze this multi-dimensional space, uh, we devised a new method called Lavender. Lavender is in intended to uncover the, the latent axis uh, that can explain the variability of the data set. Suppose we have uh, four samples showing these kind of immunological distributions. And looking at these pictures, you might, feel, you might think that the uh, top two pictures uh, might be somewhat similar because they belong to the same participant number three. But they might be a little bit different from the bottom two pictures, which, belongs to, which belong to the participant number six. So we want to quantify these differences. And for that, we follow the four steps. In step one, uh, we perform density estimation of these point clouds. So these, are, these raw data are very complicated. So we determine a grid and calculate the density of cells using k nearest neighbors method. That amounts to basically smoothening the distribution. And it, this method is non-parametric. That means 
uh, it doesn't presuppose any distributions, be it normal or Poisson or uniform. So it can deal with any complex shape of point clouds in an unbiased manner. And in step two, we measure distances between distributions using the concept of uh, kalbach leibler divergence in information, to, uh, information science. And we give it a little tweak to make it a genuine bona fide metric. And we, do, we use, uh, actually we use the that distance. And in a nutshell, it, is, uh, it, is, it tends to emphasize the accumulated peaks and focus on accumulated peaks and try to measure the intensity or the positions of these accumulated peaks. But other distances, if you like, can be used. And in step three, the based on the distances we just measured, we reconstruct samples in a new coordinate space that we call lavender space. That uses the uh, algorithm of multidimensional scaling and like this. So the distances between points uh, reflect the distances between original samples. So this is a huge dimensionality reduction from the very complicated raw data to just two or three dimensions. And then we can analyze access in this lavender space. So uh, this is a result of a dimensionality reduction for B cell samples and T cell samples. So as you can see, the each dot corresponds to each sample taken from participants and different colors denote different days, day zero, day one, day seven, day 19, in which samples were taken. And you, it might be difficult to see, but uh, you see that the same color, the same day samples form a cluster, but they are somewhat dispersed in a certain direction. And this trend is same for T cells. The same, same, day same day samples form a cluster, like black, but they are dispersed. And this is a two-dimensional projection that is easier to see. And we see that intuitively, and for BCR samples, so this horizontal axis corresponds to the time-dependent axis that, that shows the difference between days. And at the horizontal, no, vertical axis. Vertical axis is, uh, corresponds to the individuality that shows the variability between uh, each samples, same-day samples. Uh, this applies to T cells as well. So this time, the vertical axis is <coughs> more related to time, and the horizontal axis is, uh, shows the variability or individuality between samples. So this is a very uh, simple, intuitive argument, but we can make it rigorous by using tensor decomposition. So tensors are basically, in this context, are just uh, three-dimensional versions of matrices having dimensions on participants or different days and Lavender coordinates. And these, uh, this tensor can be decomposed into more simple, simpler uh, rank one tensors like this. Uh, it's actually the sum of rank one tensors. I call the, it's, called, it's called CP decomposition. So and if you look at each component and see the days component, so this is an ideal case, but uh, if, it's, if the day's component is time dependent, this component can be considered to be time dependent. And if it is uh, not dependent on time, it, it can be considered to be time independent. And actually, and we were able to separate the, the lavender coordinates into time dependent and individuality access using tensor decomposition. So we analyze the individuality access and they follow it over time. And first we uh, separated the participants into two groups based on the value of the individuality access on day zero. So group one has a lower value of individuality access, whereas group one, group two, group two people has, have uh, higher values. And as we follow over time, the, the, axis, the value of the axis is relatively stable which means that group one people tend to stay low, whereas group two people tend to stay high, even, but with occasional 
uh, switching of orders for B cells. And this trend is more conspicuous in T cells, where uh, the group at the, the individuality axis is more stable than the B cell samples. And we further looked at, uh, uh, we tried the biological characterization on the axis at D0. And we found that we, if we, when we looked at white blood cell differential counts, a group one people had more lymphocytes that, it, that is related to um, adaptive immunity or produ produce, producing antibodies. And group two are, uh, people had more neutrophils that were uh, related to innate immunity or inflammation. So group one seems to be more ready to respond to vaccine even before, even before vaccination. And this trend was verified when we looked at, when we looked at uh, uh, B cell subsets. And this is a lineage of uh, B cell differentiation from immature to naive to finally to memory or antibody producing plasma cells. And we found that group one people had more plus a larger fraction of plasma cells than group two. So supporting that group one, group one people are more ready to respond. Oh. So uh, to conclude, we analyzed variability in the immune system in a cohort of 300 volunteers who received seasonal influenza vaccine. And our lavender analysis enables us to extract critical access of individuality in an unsupervised and unbiased manner. In fact, in our data set, it uncovered the baseline immunological characteristics underlying the immune response to the vaccine, i.e. adaptive, uh, that is adaptive immunity dominant or innate immunity dominant. So this uh, kind of answers the how different question. But I think that to answer the why different question, we, need, we would need to look at more specific genes or specific cell substances that were not covered in our data set. So, uh, I would like to acknowledge co-authors, especially Daigo Okada, who is a graduate student in Yamada Lab, Ryo Yamada Lab, or, and uh, Dr. Seto, who is an immunologist uh, who, who performed experiments in Matsuda Lab. Thank you very much. So, I, I don't think I understood, okay. because um, what you showed is that there are different, maybe, populations in your patients that are more... But they basically have different immune profiles, yes. right? Yes, yes. But I didn't see the connection between that and how they are responding to the vaccination. Ah, uh, yes. And so... Yes. Uh, um, yeah. So... It, it also ignores that the, the patients would have been exposed in different ways to the flu historically, as they were uh, child, yeah. etc. So that, that yes, connection yes, is yes. not there. Uh, okay. So the, so the, uh, how to uh, evaluate the output is a uh, kind of an important question. And we measure the output of this uh, system uh, using the antibody titers. But unfortunately, the antibody titers were not in clear linear correlations with these uh, coordinates we uh, measured, but it's, as you as you mentioned, these more antibody titers are more correlated with vaccination history. Now, that is reported uh, in other studies as well. So the people who have never vaccinated, who have never been vaccinated, shows a larger response to the vaccination. And I think, in my opinion, that antibody titers are accumulation of uh, workings of uh, plasma, plasma cells. So that's a in kind of an integration. So I, I don't think it's so unnatural that if the antibody titers don't show linear relationships with what, what we do. We, we are, our, our coordinates are um, correlated with the fraction of plasma cells, but we're not directly correlated with antibody titers. So that's uh, maybe, the, as you say, the, there may be a the con the difference in concepts or what we... So, yeah, and we need to be more specific in discussing these results, I think. 
Yes, I <coughs> to me, maybe it's related to this question. So, uh, as you know, this, how do you define T and B cell population? Mm -hmm. They are very heterogeneous population. Uh, how do I define which populations? T and B cells. T, T, T and B cells. Uh, yeah, so the, there are but, uh, a large amount of studies rela uh, related to uh, defining various subsets of B cells and T cells. Uh, which, which should I use? Mm. And there are just a very basic ones. And for example, in a recent study, it was shown that uh, uh, vaccination efficacy is related to the specific subset called uh, fo uh, follicle helper, helper follicle T cells. That was not measured in this study. So, um, so that it's, I agree that this study is kind of a simplistic in, in terms of immunology, but uh, we think that the, me the same method can be used for analyzing more detailed data. One more question. Your, your group one and two, do they correlate with age? So that would be a bit correlated. Uh, no, there were no, uh, at least statistically, no uh, difference between group A and group. And I found that the one, I, I did remember which was, which was that, but in one very vol in volatile, the I mean one uh, curve showed a very volatile movement. There was a young female. Maybe young females, my, my uh, delusional idea is young females are more prone to, I don't know, so immunological, uh, act more, more active maybe immunologically. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Nutoshi, very clear time. Thank you.